Lord be with you. And also with you. So good to be with all of you today. Uh, a lot of people are traveling, but we're so uh, thankful to have uh, you with us. We have a, uh, a baptism today of uh, Amelia Rose Atkins. This is three Sundays in a row that we've had a baptism, uh, 11 o'clock two weeks ago, last Sunday at 9.30, and, and again here today. I married this uh, couple, uh, Jacqueline and Tim, about six years ago, and um, we have two uh, little boys and uh, a baby girl that uh, are the, the fruits of this uh, family, of what God joined together here in this church Seven, about six years ago. So just so good to have all of you with us. Uh, you're, you're military, is that correct? So they were in the military. They were away for a while. Children were born elsewhere, but uh, they're back in this area. So what a joy to be able to have a baptism today. A uh, lot of things going on today. It is Ascension Day observed. Ascension Day is 40 days after Easter, which was this past Thursday. So we're observing Ascension Day uh, today. Uh, it is also the seventh Sunday after Easter, and it's Memorial Day weekend where we uh, honor all those who have served and we remember those who didn't return. Very important part of our, our life as Americans, and pray God's blessing upon each of you as we uh, try to incorporate as best we can these three elements into our, our worship today. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts a week from tomorrow. Uh, it is full, about 100 kids total. Uh, next, uh, this coming Saturday, if we could get a few volunteers to help us with the build, because Vacation Bible School, we have a uh, a stage that sets up in here. We have a marketplace over in Disciples Hall. We have a craft center. We have a, um, a drama room in the upper room. And just anybody who has some muscle, a little bit of talent, not a whole lot of talent required because I'm helping. Um, so, but anyone who's just willing to give uh, maybe two hours on Saturday from 10 to 12 to help prepare, set up for VBS, we'd really appreciate your help. And then also next Sunday, after this 11 o'clock service, just some final uh, touches, like we want to put the fence around, set up a perimeter. Uh, we will have security here, uh, but want to make this as positive and safe for the children as possible, and we could use some helping hands if, if you're willing and able to do that. Those are my announcements. Oh, and the vicar today. Uh, he is preaching over at St. Paul. St. Paul has called a pastor. He will be installed on June 12th. So they needed one more, uh, one more time to have pulpit supply. So vicar was voluntold that he would be preaching there today. So that's where he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was agreeable to it. And he was agreeable, yeah. Yes. Um, so for my announcements, just real quick, junior youth and senior high youth, we have youth group this Wednesday from 5.30ish to 7ish. Last Wednesday, we put kind of the finishing touches. All spring, they, mostly the youth, have been working to uh, reclaim the youth room and to renovate it. So we've got the walls painted, a new floor in, and uh, last week we put together the pool table. So it looks like a completely different uh, room and if you see a high schooler or even junior high uh, kid, make sure to nudge them and remind them to take advantage of the labors, the fruits of their labors all this spring. They've done a great job. Another uh, announcement, uh, this past week I learned, because I'm not up on things, I guess, but I learned that not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, so it would be the Saturday after VBS, that is Faith and Family Night at the Jumbo Shrimp. And I love to go to the Jumbo Shrimp game when I can. Um, but this time, uh, the only, as far as I know, only LCMS rapper, Flame, will be the pre-game entertainment. So Lloyda and I are stoked because we're big Flame fans. And uh, anyways, based on conversations from the previous services, it looks like we are going to get a group of young adults, families together to go. If your family's interested, talk to me so I can make sure that I can get us tickets together, we can be together, and enjoy that event. That's it. That's it. All right. We're here to worship. Let's stand. We'll face the processional cross for our opening hymn, hymn Up Through Endless Ranks of Angels.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to our time of confession and absolution, you are invited to kneel as you are able. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Most merciful God, we are by nature sinful and unclean. We are guilty of placing our hopes and dreams in the people, places, and things of this world, which are here today and tomorrow are thrown in the fire. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus, who lived, died, rose, and ascended to your right hand, and lead us to bear witness to the real hope we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of the ascended Lord Jesus, and by his power and authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and bear witness to the hope that is yours because of Jesus. Thanks be to God. The congregation is invited to stand as we sing in thankfulness to our Lord. <laughs> Almighty God, as your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens, so may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, the congregation may be seated as we hear those readings appointed for the ascension of our Lord. Our first reading comes to us from the opening words of the book of Acts. In this portion of Acts, Luke recounts, as he does in his gospel, the Lord's words to his disciples, telling them that they will be his witnesses. Luke writes, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes to us from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. 
Here he mentions how our hope is tied to the ascension. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the congregation to stand as you are able for the Holy Gospel. Today we hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At this time, the congregation may be seated and the baptismal party is invited forward. This is an exciting time, three weeks in a row to have a baptism. It's really great to see that the church is growing biologically as well. I love it. And since those, uh, the wonderful wedding ceremony to see the three beautiful children. And today, Amelia Rose is added to the family of God as our Lord Jesus claims Amelia as his very own. I want to light the baptismal candle. To hold this during baptism, young man, would you like to hold that? That's a sign of the flame of the Holy Spirit that will be burning in Amelia's heart as a result of this baptism. I know that she came a little bit early on uh, April 25th, and we, here we are just a little bit over a month later. I think it's awesome that uh, you so desired to uh, have her baptized sooner than later. So next year, April 25th, she will be celebrating her first birthday, and uh, I'm sure you'll be lighting a candle, put it in a little cupcake or a little cake, watch her make a mess, uh, and celebrate her life. 
but I also would ask you to consider lighting her baptismal candle. That's yours to keep. It's hers to light that on her baptismal birthday of May 29th every year to remind her not just of her biological birth, but also her new birth in the Holy Spirit as a result of her baptism. So dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And that you, Tim and Jacqueline, as followers of Christ, have heeded that command to, uh, to baptize and to bring Amelia Rose to the waters of holy baptism today. And part of that, observing all that Jesus has commanded us, is also raising her in the faith. Because today, in these waters of baptism, she's not just baptized as Amelia Rose Atkins, she's also baptized with the name Christian. And that is a name that she will carry throughout her life. And the only way that she can have the flame fired and stoked is through the teaching, through the prayers, through the Christian guidance of her family, of taking her to Sunday school, of bringing her, her to worship, where she can continue to grow in her faith. It's a huge responsibility as parents, but our Lord saw fit to bring her into this world so that you can do that. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord also promises that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, Baptism now saves you. Peter also said in the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he adds, And this promise is for you and for your children. This isn't a promise just for old people like me. This is a promise for these precious little ones like Amelia. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the evil one until Christ claims us as his own. Therefore, depart, you unclean spirit, and make room for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amelia Rose Atkins, receive the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one loved and redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. O almighty and eternal God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, today we pray on behalf of your child, Amelia, who receives the gift of your baptism and desires your eternal grace through spiritual rebirth. Receive her, Lord, according to your promise. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Now give your blessing to her who asks and open the door to her who knocks so that she may obtain the eternal blessing of this heavenly bath and receive the promised kingdom that you give through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. They brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them but when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. I invite the congregation to please stand and to join with the family in answering the questions that I now place before them and before little Amelia. Do you renounce the devil? If so, then say, yes, I renounce him. Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? And say, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Then say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Let us then confess our holy Christian faith to one another and with Christians throughout the world 
in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you desire to have Amelia baptized? If so, then say, we do. Congregation may be seated. And Dad, Tim, I'm going to have you put the water in the baptismal font while I take this precious little one into my arms. Amelia Rose Atkins, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you this new birth of water in the Spirit, and has forgiven you all of your sins, strengthen you with his grace, now and unto life everlasting. Amelia Rose, live in that peace and that joy every day of your life. I invite the congregation to please join with me as we sing together, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me.
us, O Lord, to see in you our call to live the ascended life, a life that trusts you to do what we are unable to do for ourselves, a life of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, a life that knows you as our Savior, a life of joy-filled worship, and a life that gives witness to you. Now bless the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts, praying that these words would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text for today is from the Holy Gospel that was read just a few minutes ago. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter, I'd like to read verses 50 through 53 again. And he led them out as far as Bethany, And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. This is our text. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The ascension of our Lord is celebrated with the sounds of Easter still ringing in our ears. Easter was seven Sundays ago. Today, the seventh Sunday of Easter, those joyous sounds are still ringing in our ears even as we look forward with great anticipation to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church on Pentecost next Sunday. Ascension is meant to be a joyful celebration. And one can see that just from the readings appointed for today. All of the joy along with the hope and the power and the life that we have in the Savior are encompassed in those incredible readings that we had today. Thank God that the disciples learned about joy-filled worship. When Jesus was ascending into heaven, it says that they were filled with joy. And oftentimes when there's a departure, when someone that we care for and someone that we love is leaving us, there are tears, there is mourning, there is grief because we don't know that we're going to see them again or how long it's going to be. But in our text for today, the disciples, even as Jesus is ascending into heaven, telling them to go wait in Jerusalem until they receive power on high, Jesus ascending into heaven, they are not afraid of his departure. They are filled with joy. And maybe one of the ways that we can kind of relate to to this is maybe, at least in my mind, I remember when my grandparents used to visit. And it would be a wonderful visit, and I got lots of attention and lots of hugs and lots of candy. When it came time for them to leave, I would always cry because I didn't know when I was going to see them again. I love my grandparents so much. And I never knew when I was going to see them again. And then there would be this joyful reunion, and then they would leave. And then I would cry again. But fortunately, that kept coming back and coming back. And, but the disciples didn't have that sense of of sadness when Jesus ascended into heaven. In fact, it was just the opposite. It says that they were filled with exceedingly great joy. And they went to Jerusalem where they gathered in worship, the Bible says, continually. So thank God that the disciples learned about joy-filled worship because before the ascension, in fact, even for a few days after the resurrection, the disciples were totally confused about who Jesus was, about what his mission was to be, about what he had come to establish. They knew that he had come to establish a kingdom, but they were confused with what kind of kingdom it was going to be. They thought that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom where he would rule on a throne in Jerusalem. 
And so they argued amongst themselves about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God and the restoration of Israel as an influence and a political power in the world. And they wanted to be a part of his cabinet, a part of his team. And so they argued amongst themselves who got to have what role, who was the greatest among them that deserved a position of power in God's kingdom, totally confused about who Jesus was and why he had come. And even the mother of James and John <laughs> tries to connive, to manipulate Jesus to make sure that one of her sons, John, would sit on the, the right hand of his throne and her other son, James, would sit on the other side of his throne in his kingdom. Peter, of course, was confused. He argued with Jesus, tried to prevent Jesus from going to Jerusalem to die. Jesus had told him that was a part of his mission, that the only way he could fulfill his mission was to go to Jerusalem to be handed over to evil men and to suffer and to die. And Peter said, may it never be so. As he placed himself, planted himself in front of Jesus, and Jesus said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. And even that same Peter who had defended Jesus so vehemently in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter arises and pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus. And Jesus tells him to put his sword back in his scabbard. He heals the ear of Malchus. And yet Peter, who had defended Jesus so vehemently in that garden of Gethsemane, that very same night, Peter observed Jesus on trial, became afraid. He knew that he was going to die. And he walked out in the courtyard and said three times, I do not know the man. Thomas doubted him. Even after the resurrection, all of the disciples hid because they were afraid. But now at the ascension, at the ascension they know who Jesus is. They have seen him. He's appeared to them twice. He's eaten in front of them. In our, just before our text today, they give him a piece of broiled fish, perhaps still wondering who he was, and Jesus wanted to show them that, that he wasn't a phantasm, that he wasn't a ghost, that, that he had a physical body, that this was a physical resurrection. The disciples had spoken with him. Two of them, Cleopas and another disciple, had walked along the Emmaus Road, and it said that their hearts burned within them as he reveals himself to them in the scriptures and in the breaking of bread. In our text for today, he says the same thing. He reveals himself to them in the scriptures. He tells them that he has fulfilled all of the law and all of the prophets, that he's the only one who has ever lived, who has completely fulfilled the law in every way, shape, and form so that he could make the perfect sacrifice on Calvary's cross and that he had fulfilled all of the prophecies throughout the centuries about who the Messiah would be. He is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. And he had come to establish a kingdom not in this world and not of this world, but in the world that is to come. In his kingdom where he had told his disciples that he would go and prepare a place for them. So thank God that he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures and see who he was. Why he had come the kingdom that he had come to establish, his death on the cross for their forgiveness, and his resurrection as a promise of their own resurrection. And so they worship him. And they worship him with exceedingly great joy because they know that he's the son of God. They know why he came as God's sacrifice for sin. They know why he rose as salvation for the world. And now even Peter knows why Good Friday had to happen. 
Because if Good Friday didn't happen, Jesus didn't happen, or, or Easter didn't happen. If Good Friday didn't happen, Easter didn't happen. Because without a death, there is no resurrection. Jesus had to die, and he had to pay that ultimate sacrifice so that there could be a resurrection. A few years ago, I spoke to a man who said, Jesus didn't really die. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, the biblical record, the historical record is pretty clear about Jesus' death. And he says, well, not really. He says, I don't believe that. He said, I think what I understand, he said, is that Jesus took some kind of herbs and medications that have put him into a, like a deep sleep, like a, a, a semi-conscious state. And his breathing became rather shallow so that nobody could see that he was really alive. And that's why he appeared three days later. And I said, There's, where's the hope in that? He says, well, it was a moral victory. I said, give me a break. <laughs> A moral victory? The only kind of victory that really counts is if there's a death. If there's a sacrifice. If there's a sacrifice for you and for me. And I was looking at him. I said, if, if Jesus didn't die, he didn't rise. He died for you. It was a real death that he died. And a real resurrection that took place. And without the death, there's no resurrection. And I said to him, I said, don't give me that, that diet because there's not an, a single ounce, a single calorie that has any benefit for my life or yours. If Christ has not been raised, my faith is in vain. And if Christ didn't die, there is no Easter. And the disciples came to know that and the result of their understanding was that they were continually in the temple praising God. Let me describe a scene to you that I think maybe can help us to understand the purpose of our, our worship and the purpose behind our joy-filled worship. Imagine, if you will, an old man walking down a Florida beach and the sun is beginning to set this big orange ball setting in the western horizon as we see so beautifully and so often here in Florida. The sun is setting and most of the sunbathers have therefore left. There are a few joggers on the beach, some couples join hand in hand as they walk along the beach and this bent over old man and his bony fingers, he's carrying a bucket. It's a bucket of shrimp. And he heads towards a pier, an isolated pier. And he begins to walk to the, end, to the end of the pier. And all of this shrimp, it's not for him. It's not for the fish in the ocean. It's for the birds. <laughs> And he comes to the end of the pier and he puts the bucket down and he stands there for just a couple of minutes. And within those couple of minutes, soon the sky is full of these dancing dots and the, the, the screeching of the, of the birds is, is loud. And he begins to feed them one by one. And after about a half an hour, this bucket of shrimp is empty. See, they were on this pilgrimage to, to meet this old man. It's something that he did every Friday night about sunset, year after year and week after week. And even when the shrimp is gone, they continue to linger. They land on his shoulder, they're on the moorings, they're on the pier. And this old man did it because he could not let a single week go by without saying thank you. His name was Eddie Rickenbacker, and if you were alive in October of 1942, you may remember the day that his plane went down. 
As I look out in the sanctuary today, I don't see too many that were alive in 1942, but maybe a few. You may remember that story, and if you don't, I commend it to you. I didn't read this story on Wikipedia or on Google. I heard it firsthand from a member of this church, a man who was named after Eddie Rickenbacker. His name himself was Ed, named after his uncle. And he told me the story about how his uncle, Eddie Rickenbacker, in World War II was given an assignment to deliver a message to General Douglas MacArthur in the South Pacific and with a hand-picked crew in a B-17 took off to deliver this message. And for whatever reason, the navigation system went haywire. Eddie and the crew became lost. They ran out of fuel and they ditched the plane in the ocean. All eight crew members survived the crash. They linked their three life rafts together. After three days, they ran out of rations. On the eighth day, as they were suffering from dehydration and the effects of the elements and the sun and beginning to die from hunger and thirst, they held a devotional service on their raft and they prayed together for a miracle. Ed told me the story about his uncle Eddie who said that he had pulled his cap down over his eyes and he awakened to feel something on his head. He said he doesn't know how he knew but he knew that it was a seagull. And if he could capture that seagull, it meant food and at least potential survival. And he caught that seagull. The flesh was eaten, divided equally between those who were still alive, and the intestines were used as fish bait. And they survived, rescued 24 days after the crash took place. And as a result, every Friday evening, this old Captain Rickenbacker walked to the pier, his bucket full of shrimp, and his heart full of thanks. And as Christians, we do the same. But as Christians, we have even more reason to gather together regularly and to give thanks because we too were rescued by a, by a sacrificial visitor. We too were rescued by one who journeyed from only God knows where to make the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. And we, like this old captain, have every reason to look up and to worship to worship the one who sacrificed his life for us, to worship the one who did not abandon us, but promised the Holy Spirit who would fill our lives, always pointing us to Jesus, leading us, filling us with hope, and giving us the comfort that we need in the times of our darkest moments. We come together just as those first disciples did in joyful worship. That's what they did. They gathered. The Bible says they gathered together continually in the temple praising God. And that would continue. Pentecost, what, did it, what happened? The church was born. 3,000 were converted in one day. And what happened? It says that they gathered together in the temple every day to break bread, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to hear the preaching of the apostles, to pray together, and to have fellowship with one another. And we do the same. That's why we're here today. Tell me that that's why you're here today. I'm so thankful that we have the live stream. It's been a blessing to us during this, the pandemic. But I read just recently that many people who have not worshipped in the last two years coming together as the body of Christ, but many will never come back. 
For those who are watching on the live stream right now, I'm asking you to come back to church, to come back with the physical body of Christ, to hear the preaching of the apostles, and to gather around our Lord's table as the body of Christ with those who are here. We can do no other. It's why the writer to the Hebrews in the 10th chapter said, do not forsake the gathering of the people of God in regular worship. And we come together in this place. The plane that Eddie was piloting was known as the Flying Fortress. Today we are not gathered in the Flying Fortress, but we are gathered in the church knowing as the Mighty Fortress where the word of God is our pilot, our guide, always taking us to Jesus, where he is the church's one foundation, and where we look up and see him as our risen and ascended Lord. I think it's fascinating as I bring this to conclusion today. I think it's fascinating that Luke ends his gospel the same way he began. He ends it by saying they were continually in the temple praising God. In his first chapter, in Luke chapter 1, it begins with Zechariah and Elizabeth in the temple praising God because Elizabeth was with child, John the Baptist. And in Luke chapter 2, Simeon and Anna are in the temple praising God because they had seen Jesus. And at the end... The disciples in Luke 24 are in the temple continuously praising God. They have seen Jesus. They know where he's going, and they know he's coming back. And you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are gathered here today in the temple praising God, praising our ascended Lord, knowing and believing that we are not left alone, that he is with us in his word and sacraments, and that he is coming back for us to take us to the kingdom that he has prepared for us. May it be so for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Please stand as you are able for our time of prayer. This morning our prayer response will be, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In praise of our King who has gone up with a shout and the sound of a trumpet, ascended in triumph and is seated at God's right hand, that we would ever rejoice and live in the truth of his victory for us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the proclamation of the church as she goes into all the world and to the whole creation with the gospel, that many may believe, be baptized, and be saved. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the homes of God's people, that God would strengthen the love of husbands and wives and bless parents and children as they gather around his word, especially this day, uh, praying for the family of little Amelia Rose. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who know shock, sorrow, and helplessness before the evils that afflict us and afflict our country, that our Heavenly Father would mercifully embrace the frightened in his love, empower the weak with his strength, restrain the wicked by his might, and preserve the righteous by his grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Ben Bryant, Janet Wigman, Paul Huber, Eunice Shower, Carol Carroll, Don Arthur, Terry Spock, and to all grieving families in Texas, as well as for all who suffer in our midst, that the Lord would deliver them from sicknesses of body and mind and from every other power of the enemy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
night which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
may this, the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in body and soul, now and unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast that awaits us when your Son returns. Keep us firm in the true faith and lead us as your witnesses, proclaiming repentance and the forgiveness of sins to everyone. In the name of your Son, our ascended Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.